Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. I'm Mary Odellini. I'm the Vice Chair for Education here. And it's um, my pleasure to introduce our first CAPE-sponsored Grand Rounds. For those of you who aren't familiar with CAPE, it's our Children's Academy of Pediatric Educators. And uh, these are a group of 30 faculty here at Children's National who have completed advanced education training through the Master Teacher Leadership Development Program, which is a combined program between the schools of education and medicine at GW, or some other type of advanced educational training. And uh, we have 30 elite faculty in this academy, and they are committed to doing educational research as well as faculty development and mentorship. And they're not only changing the way we are teaching here at Children's National, but have made significant impact on the way we're educating across the country in pediatrics. And so it's um, really terrific to have one of the most innovative pediatric educators that I know of here to be our grand round speaker today, Dr. Todd Cheng. I had the pleasure to get to know while he had his brief um, stint here at Children's National in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Um, and unfortunately, from my perspective, but I think a good move on uh, Todd's perspective is that he went back to the West Coast, uh, to his home, where he has been very successful. He is an associate professor of pediatrics and emergency medicine, as well as the director for research and scholarship at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and the University of Southern California. His research interests are in uh, studying the effectiveness of e-learning, serious games, and most recently, virtual reality simulation using the cool 3D goggles. He's worked with the um, Hollywood set and all of the educational innovators out in Southern California. And so he's here today to um, help us understand where things are with uh, 3D simulation, particularly around uh, simulating pediatric resuscitation in the emergency department. Dr. Chang. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you guys for the honor and pleasure for being able to come back and tell you a lot about um, what we've been working on at CHLA and why I spend probably a little bit more time now with uh, not real patients than real patients, although both are just as equally fun. Um, I do have to give you some disclosures. I do serve as an independent uh, subject matter expert for video game companies um, for a combined salary total, by the way, of zero dollars right now. So that's my disclosure. Um, we used to have uh, grant support from Oculus from Facebook, which is what the project will be about. I will talk more about Oculus because the hardware is more familiar to me. However, it does not serve as an uh, endorsement of one company or another. All right. Um, like Mary said, thank you for the lovely introduction. I'm an educator by heart, so we have measurable smart objectives. First, we get to define virtual reality, which is actually not that easy because the definition keeps changing. Um, I get to tell you a little bit about the trials and tribulations of what we faced when we did our virtual reality uh, work. Um, some of our pilot data that we have looking at physiological changes, as well as some discriminant validity as an assessment tool for VR. Uh, as it applies to a hospital setting. And then um, a little bit of brainstorming, I suppose, we can get everybody involved, excited about the next step in the future for medicine, healthcare, and in particular, Children's National. So first and foremost is your dictionary lesson, and we get to define what virtual reality is. And right around 2013, the definition of VR is about changing, and in 2018, if you use a regular old search engine like Google and type in virtual reality, you will get something different than if you go to PubMed and look for virtual reality articles where VR no longer um, stands for something on the screen, but it really stands for something that's called 3D head-mounted display virtual reality. And because we're lazy, we're just going to call it VR. So virtual reality used to be like this. How many remember the movie Lawnmower Man? Back in the day, that was the first, entrance where, uh, first instance where the word virtual reality became popular in Hollywood, 
And this is what used to be called virtual reality, which is currently called virtual world. So you're allowed to use the adjective virtual, um, but VR currently in 2018 starts sounding very differently. So if you have something that's remotely three-dimensional, that's walking around, or for example, in Second Life, this is what used to be known as virtual reality. Um, now it's termed as a virtual world or a virtual patient. For our surgical colleagues um, or proceduralists, you have virtual task trainers, again, slightly different than VR at the moment. So this is what VR does look like uh, nowadays. Um, don't know if you guys know who this is. This is Audra Fain. She used to work here as researcher. But uh, with a head-mounted display, all of your movements are replicated, which also includes her walking forward and back. And depending on the controllers that are attached to it, you can see your own hands in there. And then just because you're uh, working in technology doesn't mean that you have any yeah, problems here. So um, this is what um, this is an Oculus Rift um, in my current office, uh, where you essentially you can move your head around and it will actually show you what's going on, um, as opposed to seeing something static on a screen and a screen is moving itself. So I'm going to go over uh, geek out just a little bit. The holidays are coming, so you should know this terminology for your kids. Uh, so we're going to talk about degree of freedom, which does not refer to a physical component here. So there's such a thing called a 3DOF uh, virtual reality headset. And the 3DOF allows you to do these three cardinal movements, which is all rotational. Uh, so for those of you who have pilot licenses, these terms are pretty obvious to you. But your phone will automatically do this. Uh, so if you do a panoramic shot, for example, it's quite sensitive to you rotating, but it's not very sensitive to um, uh, a vector movement, it's just a rotational movement. So 3DOF um, hardware includes these guys. Because your phone can do it, there are devices where you attach your phone into a device. Um, the phone will have an app. You have two different stereotopic images, and it creates a 3D image for you. So even some of the devices, Google Dreamcast is on your left, Cardboard is on the middle and there's a Gear VR on phone, Samsung phones on the right, and all the smaller um, VR headsets at the drugstore, at Target, those tend to be uh, three degrees of freedom um, using a phone. And then if you don't have your phone around, there are standalone devices, so these are three of them right here. This is the Oculus Go on the left, the Vive Focus up on the top, and the Mirage Solo on the right. There are probably more uh, outside of the United States as well. These no longer require you to have a phone. It projects on its own. And therefore, you're also allowed to have some level of controller that you can see over there. The thing with three degree of freedom is that because you can rotate freely, you, but you cannot move in it. In other words, what's projected as an image, if you move forward, is identical. So you can't tell if you're moving uh, visually, but you're absolutely moving in real life. It can be particularly vertiginous and nauseating. So for a three degree of freedom, virtual reality is best if you're captive, uh, sitting down and enjoying the view from a variety of different ways. So it's basically like a personal IMAX theater. Um, this is particularly used for anatomic visualization uh, in healthcare, and then you'll see different types of VR on this type of system. So let's add three more degrees of freedom and allow you to move throughout space. These are very video gamey terms of elevating, surging, and strafing. These are not allowed with three degrees of freedom, but with six degrees of freedom, you can actually freely move. However, the technology then requires you to know where the device is in, uh, in the 3D space. So most of the technologies for six degree of freedom VR require sensors so that it can tell where it is in absolute space. Uh, the three big ones right now, so six uh, degree of freedom VR, which have wires attached to them, uh, the Oculus Rift is on the left, PlayStation VR from Sony, and HTC Vive Pro is on the right. All of them have, you require some level of external sensors so that it knows where in space your device is. And that way it can smoothly move forward, back and forth, and walking around as well. Uh, these are advertisement pictures, which is why they hide the wires, but it's absolutely connected to it. Fortunately, there are wireless solutions. Uh, this is the Oculus Quest, which is about to come out in March 2019, that actually allows six degrees of freedom 
the sensors are built in, and there's called inside-out sensor. So it will continue to scan the room to see if you have moved in the room. And that's how it knows that you've moved forward, backward, crouched, whatever the movement is. Um, I was talking to um, uh, some folks earlier, and because technology is so fast, these slides that I turned in one week ago is already obsolete. Um, the uh, HTC Vive Focus now has a six degree of freedom uh, augment or an upgrade that was just announced as well. So HTC is also continuing in this particular market. The reason this is actually a big deal, particularly for healthcare, is that once you're free of the wire, you can do this. Um, in this example, you are shooting each other, which we don't want to do for healthcare, but because you don't have wires, you are allowed to do multiplayer or multi-user simulations uh, in a virtual environment, and you don't have to be in the same room if you don't want to. Right? All you need is a relatively good Wi-Fi experience or 5G network or higher. So this opens up the idea of using teamwork, maybe surrounding a patient in a resuscitation, um, an OB procedure, uh, an OR, all sorts of opportunities now arise if your wireless can move your hands around without any issues. One of the things that you'll learn about the tech industry is that it tends to blur the present and the future, particularly the journalists. So it's very difficult to tell what is imminently happening in the next few months and what is fortuitously happening, hopefully in 10 years, please give us money. Um, so the what you'll see is these terminologies kind of changing around. Probably in the next five years, these will also start changing. But I want to let you know how the tech industry uses these three terms and how it might apply to healthcare these days. So the first is the virtual reality, augmented reality, which I'm going to call AR, and mixed reality, which is actually abbreviated XR. On the left is virtual reality, and the purpose of VR is really to occlude you from true reality. So you should not be able to see anything outside of what is being projected. So the programmers, developers, or the camera crew have to replace all of your reality in VR. This is different than AR, so augmented reality, where it attempts to project something onto reality. So this is the Microsoft Windows HoloLens. You can actually see through this and see whatever it is that you're supposed to see. On top of that, it will project something, a screen, a baby, uh, whatever. Um, the most famous augmented reality, which I think one third of you uh, statistically should have, um, is this. How many of you know what this is? Right, Pokemon Go. Um, so this is augmented reality in its uh, easiest form. And this is also why the uh, smartphone companies, which includes the Apple and Samsung, are actually quite interested in AR because it uses the phone's camera to, to see what's behind it, and then little Pikachu's just project it on. The difference between AR and XR is that it doesn't really matter where you are, Pikachu's going to appear. So in this case, it's on a grab. If you're in the bathroom and playing this, then Pikachu will be literally on the toilet. Right? It doesn't actually interact with the, the realistic setting. It just projects something there. So that's actually AR. If you want your digital image to interact with reality, then you have XR. So this is a, um, a basically a hologram, if you will, of three shared XR images. It is technically interacting with the world because it has to interact with a tabletop. Right? So if you move around your head, the image is not going to move. And, it, and then once you, uh, hopefully, if the programmers do it correctly, once your head is below the table and looking up, then you should not be able to see the house because the table is blocking it. Right. All these simple considerations that seem obvious to us have to be pre-programmed in, and that's a big deal for XR. Any questions so far? So let's talk about whether VR is the right choice. And one of the, uh, the, the skeptics in us uh, basically say, well, we've actually, it's not that our training up until now has been completely worthless. Um, it's that VR can be an augment to what we're doing, but is it the right choice for what we're trying to do? What we currently see in about 2018, 20, 2017, 2018, is these are the four 
pillars of where VR currently appears in healthcare. Two of them focus mostly on the patient, so they're given to the patients themselves, whether they're adult or children, and then two of them are so providers, whether they're physicians, nurses, um, mid-level providers, EMTs, uh, for both training and for clinical care. We'll go over one by one. There's something called therapeutic escape. This doesn't require that much um, or thought. You just want to take the patient out of the current reality. So this is currently used for children who are getting vaccines, for example. You place them in a VR headset. It doesn't really matter what they're doing in VR. It's just as long as they're not getting shot in VR, right? Um, there are some VRs that are a little bit more sophisticated where it attempts to put a stimulus somewhere close to the left shoulder or the right shoulder in VR right about the time that the physician or the nurse um, does the injection. You can time it a little bit better as well. Um, most of these therapeutic escape VRs are um, billed as lifestyle devices. They don't go through any FDA clearance. Uh, they can be bought, rented at your favorite uh, app store. Alternatively, you can, instead of taking the patient away from reality, you can put them in a very specific reality. So we call that therapeutic desensitization. This is a company called MindWave from London, where it attempts gradually to habituate you to slightly unhygienic conditions in the bathroom for those of us who have increased anxiety in using bathrooms like this. So you start with a pristine light bulb bathroom, and then you go into a slightly dingy bathroom all the way until a place that you probably would uh, scream and run out of. So this is called therapeutic desensitization. We actually have a fair amount of literature, particularly in Southern California, with, uh, with war veterans and PTSD. You can tr control the reality that they enter back into so that they can process their emotions and debrief thereafter. It's actually been quite successful in decreasing medication use and decreasing uh, suicidality as well. That's therapeutic desensitization. Essentially, you're either taking them out of reality or you're putting them into a very carefully constructed reality. Um, we talked about some um, earlier about anatomic visualization where virtual reality is actually quite strong now because you can walk around certain anatomical constructs that are particularly com uh, complex. So this is the Stanford chart that shows the different types of congenital heart disease. They're both for providers and for patients. And you can actually walk through and zoom in see where the blood flows and see what the post-surgical changes might look like. And alternatively, you can use what's called 360 cameras to project exactly what's happening in a very complex environment, such as an OR or a resuscitation phase. So this is also a, a three-dimensional visualization, but it uses the camera instead of an actual pre-rendered program. And then finally, we can also use uh, virtual reality for simulation. And this is a, a screenshot of our earliest prototype of what it looks like. This is the replicate of the trauma room in CHLA. Um, and you can use simulation just like you would with mannequin-based simulation with its own inherent benefits and drawbacks. And that's just simulation training or assessment. And the way you think about the final part is that if it's not a great simulation, then you shouldn't be doing any VR, right? You must have a clinical topic or need that is legitimate. You must have discrete learning objectives that you want to meet with your virtual reality. And you have to ask, is simulation or visualization the right move to do it anyway? Right? If it's not, then it may not be worth the investment in VR. Your main competitor, of course, is Simulation. So mannequin-based simulation is quite strong and has a, quite a bit of evidence behind it, whereas virtual reality is relatively new and the evidence is still accumulating. So if you can do this really well with mannequin-based simulation, it may not need to be done with VR, um, so you have to think very carefully what the advantages are of VR uh, over this. Uh, here's the disadvantages that you have to overcome. It's really difficult to make changes in situ during a VR simulation. A really skilled mannequin-based simulator uh, or simulationist can change the scenario on the fly depending on the difficulty level that's needed. For example, if a group comes in and it's totally, um, totally going through the scenario much faster than you thought it would, you can very quickly add some challenges immediately. Right? 
In virtual reality, it's all pre-programmed. You have to know the branching logic ahead of time. Um, VR also has very poor haptics currently. Um, does anyone know what haptics are? <laughs> Get it? Yeah, raise your hand. Um, so haptics is essentially the sensation of touch. VR is quite good at audiovisual fidelity, but it's particularly terrible at haptics. Does it feel like the human body? Does it feel like a certain organ? These are not very well projected, even with the current gloves uh, and the vibration devices. They don't match anywhere with the mannequins or even the real standardized patients can be. And then there's really high uh, front end cost. VR programming is particularly expensive compared to all other types of programming as well. So if it's still worth it, um, then you're looking at uh, comparing different types of simulations. So on the left, you have your standard mannequin simulation. You also have what's called screen-based simulations, where if you just have it on the computer screen, sometimes that's all you need. And then on the right, you have virtual reality. Um, and when we're thinking about the different types of simulations, you have different advantages and disadvantages, where while virtual reality can really put you into a total audiovisual immersion, it has very minimal haptics. Um, and while with screen-based simulations, it has a fairly robust data collection because you have to program it in ahead of time, sometimes the hardware restrictions for VR and the space restrictions, if you're moving all over the place, are a little bit more prohibitive. All right. Now we get to tell you a little bit about the fun that we got to have over in 2016 uh, with our experience in VR. Uh, this is uh, Josh Sherman on the, the right, who is the co-PI with me. Uh, Rick Short is uh, the founder, one of the founders and uh, uh, CEOs of BioFlight VR. They used to work on TV shows like uh, CSI, and they're particularly good at rendering um, gory uh, physiological changes. And that's what, that's what happens when you're in Hollywood. So there's technically four key personnel that you must have in, when you create VR in this case. First is a content expert, which will most likely be yourself. You're the healthcare providers who are the, the intended target of these uh, VR simulations. You also need some animation or asset developers. This can either be rendered and programmed or it can be filmed, depending on which direction you want to go. You need to make sure that the objects move and the characters move and the environment is as realistic as you need it. You also need your programmers and coders uh, this is very similar to mannequin-based simulation, where you program in a different physiology, a type of physiology, and you can ask them to collect data on the back end so that you know how your users are doing and get feedback. And then possibly most importantly, you need money uh, for funders. The funders can be from one of these other three places, or they can be uh, from a different philanthropic or grant organization. So in our um, core test, uh, Oculus from Facebook was our funder. BioFlight uh, was, had experience with movie sets, so they actually created all the characters and objects. AI Solve is a studio in London that sells in healthcare-related programming, and then we provided the medical expertise. This is uh, some folks from BioFlight who came over to our Trauma One room. So this is our actual trauma room. Um, ours is more on the wide side rather than our trauma rooms here where they're more long. Um, and they essentially filmed and, uh, and replicated all the different equipment from our trauma room into VR. So this is them taking photos and attempting for the first steps at rendering. We also then, uh, because we're Hollywood, uh, wrote the script of what each player and character would say, uh, depending on the different reactions that we wanted. So this is Josh and Rick going over the different scripts. And then, because we're Hollywood, and this is the most Southern California slide I have for you, we rented a motion capture studio next to the beach. Um, we've got a whole bunch of uh, nurses on their off days, this is, uh, Josh and myself. We got captured in motion capture, and we turned into different characters. This is Shauna. She made us vegan kale smoothies, and some dude with a man bun told us what to do. So that's what happens when you're on the West Coast. Uh, um, when we were uh, working with our London colleagues, we made flowcharts similar to the way you make uh, mannequin-based simulations, right? So you can make it very complex or very simple. We opted for the simpler version here. 
Um, and these got turned into different programming branch stream logic in the back end. Finally, we wanted to know time to critical actions as one of our alpha metrics of our performance. Um, the, the catch here is that we don't know what game time is versus real time. We are currently using this game time. So, um, most people don't take 45 seconds to do it. That be, uh, you have to find it, you have to draw it up. So 45 seconds is pretty remarkable. Um, and then, you know, 15 seconds of crackles are a little bit pretty ambitious. But again, these are all game time. But we needed some preliminary metrics to see how game time works compared to real time. So at the end of all of this, this was actually a six month really fervent um, effort. And I get to show you uh, with sound um, our, one of our scenarios. The purpose of these simulations is to basically expose you to this stress and the anxiety of doing a resuscitation in pediatrics. So for those of you who do it regularly, there's a certain pitch of the pulse act that makes your you know, sphincters tighten um, that we hopefully replicated here. And we forewent some of the other things that seem a little bit more fake because we just wanted to emphasize the, the psychological fidelity as well. <laughs> Doctor, this is a one-year-old male found by the mother at home having a seizure. The seizure's been lasting about seven minutes. Blood glucose on scene was 90. You have to do something. He is seizing. He is seizing. Help him. Doctor, Why are what you do you want to do? Thanks. Now that you're all awake, um, thank you for watching the Oscar performances. 
Um, so as you can tell, there are some medical things that are not 100% accurate. For example, the, the tube that's just kind of sticking out of the patient's mouth. Um, but we opted to forego that type of reality for the more the anxiety provoking reality so that you can actually see if you can find the algorithm, do your ABCs, and do what seems to be simple on paper and pencil onto what could be real life. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the pilot research that we were doing in conjunction with the development in terms of building the foundational evidence for the use of VR in healthcare. Right. And the background is pretty simple. There isn't very much background. We know that these types of low-frequency, high-stakes medical events provoke um, provider stress in a variety of different uh, disciplines, but they're also an infrequent training opportunity. Um, you guys have some rapid response teams or pre-code teams here, right? And those are absolutely wonderful for our safety of our patients, but it also means our code blue events are rarer, and that means that we don't get as many of those uh, for our experiential training. Finally, we also know that VR is completely unproven and emerging as a simulation technology for these types of events. So our aims really were to provide the foundational evidence. The first one is to describe provider stress physiologies during actual virtual reality resuscitations because we emphasize being able to perform under that level of stress. And secondly, our second aim was to determine any performance differences that the VR could capture between residents who are the relative novices to attendings who are the relative experts and the simulations that we created specifically for this project, which included status epilepticus and anaphylactic shock. All right, so here's our aim one, and to measure stress physiology, we turned to the literature and we decided to use salivary cortisol levels and a mean heart rate during those events. So this is what we normally look like without clothes. Uh, so we recruited emergency medicine faculty and fellows within our hospital. Uh, we picked four swing shifts, so our swing shifts started anywhere as early as 10 a.m. or as late as 3 p.m. Um, for analysis. They went on for eight hours, and we picked those because we wanted the, uh, the salivary cortisol to have a similar diurnal pattern as opposed to the overnight or the morning shift. We also chose an off day for them to come back to do VR. We also excluded folks with any heart conditions, um, whether it's surgical or non-surgical, anyone on significant beta blockade or a severe asthma, anyone who was pregnant in any of the four shifts or the VR day, or any of our nocturnists who did not work um, normal shifts. Um, we then made every one of these people wear one of these hexoskin suits, which has a three-lead EKG inside that transmits to your phone through Bluetooth so we can watch their heart rate um, any time that we wanted. It was a lot of fun. And then we had research assistants that followed them around and swapped all of our attendings with salivary cortisol. So, um, so during an ED shift, we decided to have three uh, protocolized collection times for salivary cortisol, and this is about the time when we also measure their heart rate, even though we could continuously measure their heart rate pre, mid, and post, so the four-hour mark and the eight-hour mark. And any time there was what was called a critical event, so we call them a level one trauma, which is a trauma stat, or anything re that requires um, 8198, that's the same number, I still remember that number. Um, or any critical triage, any patient that got walked right past triage into the bed, then the research assistant followed them along and swapped yet another um, uh, salivary cortisol. That's very dry mouth that day. When we invited them back to VR, because we had two modules, we randomized the order uh, of their VR. We also recognized that some of us have particularly not so great hand-eye coordination, particularly with controllers or video games. So we had a fairly lengthy tutorial. Uh, they either did our, the, the first module or second module. We repeated the tutorial, and then one more time with the, the complementary module. And we still did the heart rate and cortisol taken in the beginning, middle, and end during this one hour VR session, just like you see here. Unfortunately, we did not have enough funding to make them do eight hours of VR. So for this analysis, our independent variable is essentially the two modalities, real or versus not real. We have some confounder variables that we wanted to make sure that the skill level, actual shift start time, and caffeine intake is measured on the Likert scale. Again, we were not able to standardize caffeine intake during our shift. That would have been very catastrophic. Um, and spoiler alert, none of these are actual studies. 
Um, the alpha variables that we also measured were heart rates as a mean of five minutes during the precise recording time, either of the salivary cortisol time or the critical event. Um, and then the salivary cortisol levels measured in micrograms or deciliter. Our analysis was um, our initial hypothesis was equivalent. We hypothesized that the physiology changes would be identical and equivalent from real to VR, which, looking back, um, is, that was an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, basically, using a 95th confidence interval overlap method. So, if you overlap, then you were considered equivalent. If you did not, you were not. Aim two was to determine performance differences within the game between residents and attending uh, within VR. So uh, the outcome variables in this case were time two critical actions that you saw in that one graph, as well as the number of same treatments, which represents a block somehow of moving on across the algorithm. So in this protocol, we recruited residents as well to complete the identical VR protocol as the attending. Again, within the one hour VR session, we had three uh, uh, times where we collected heart rates and cortisol. And then the independent variable in this case was experience. Uh, confounder variables included any VR or video game experience. And at the time of this pilot, uh, the controllers were brand new to VR, so everyone came with zero experience. Um, and spoiler alert, video game experience, that's no there. No effect. Our outcome variables are time to critical actions in real seconds that we measured. Again, we don't know what this real second means uh, and the number of uh, repeated actions. Um, because this was totally exploratory, we just used simple man way to use that. Okay, so we had 16 providers, um, captured 69 shifts, and in those 69 shifts with 16 providers, we had about 31 events. Um, 25 of them were ESI level one triage uh, or trauma, and then we also selected the port um, anaphylaxis and active seizure at the time. Here are some of the heart rate changes that occurred. So this is a scale from I'm very, very calm to oh my goodness, not so calm. Uh, in the emergency department, the, uh, the mean delta of change between a non-critical shift versus a critical shift was 13.9. In addition, in VR, between before VR and inter VR, the actual delta was 6.5. Both of these increases in the delta were significant, however, when compared to those to each other, they were not found to be equivalent. When we look more at the salivary cortisol changes, again, this is zero, which should not happen, and this is particularly high, um, more so on the like the 6 a.m., 7 a.m. level. In the emergency department, uh, the delta increase for salivary cortisol from a non-critical shift, in other words, you made it eight hours without any resuscitation, versus a critical shift, you, did, you actually had a resuscitation or event, is 0.1, which is a significant value. However, we did not find any meaningful or significant salivary cortisol changes while in VR. And when comparing the two deltas, we did not find equivalent. Um, a little bit of, of the results and performance in our exploratory analyses. The first row we're going to show um, is about our module on anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock. Um, we were pleasantly uh, surprised to find that our residents did quite well, and there were very few differences found between residents and attending. The most prominent one being the aptitude or the tendency to go straight to cricothyronomy, so seeing forward is cricothyronomy. Uh, the attending took only 30, 30 seconds or so to jab something in their throat. The residents were a little bit more wary of doing that, taking 90 seconds. In the seizure scenario, the one that you saw already, the number of anti-epileptics given in the algorithms were actually significantly higher for the residents. So on, on average, residents gave 4.6 doses of uh, 0.1 milligrams of uh, kilo of lorazepam versus 2.6. Um, and these are scenarios where the Ativan was programmed not to work. In other words, you had to go up the algorithm to an alternative, 1.7 for the phosphonatone and 1 for the attending. Now, we're not quite sure whether this meant that the residents were stuck in the algorithm or if there was a technical issue that did not allow them the situational awareness to know that the medication was given. 
So we're still looking through the, the recordings right now, um, but these are pretty much the only performance differences out of quite a handful of them that we track of our performance differences. And this uh, secondary analysis was physiology differences uh, in VR between residents and attending. Residents did have slightly higher heart rates, about six higher than attending. We think this is probably age-related. Um, However, the mean uh, salivary cortisol was markedly higher when the residents were attending. Again, we did them at the relatively same time during the day. So it's unlike the diurnal differences. And this is a little bit more than what we'd expect from age. So perhaps something is going on here, and this is where we're going to base our next, uh, next group of studies. Some lessons learned from all of this. Um, the user experience, in other words, the controllers do need to simplify. One of the data points that I'm not showing you is how low our older attendings were in navigating the controls. So we actually saw tremendous improvement from tutorial one to tutorial two, where they first started with, what is this thing, to actually being able to point and being able to effectively use their medical knowledge in VR. Um, we also found that um, perhaps as a good thing, even though we aimed it at our uh, PGY2 pediatric residents, this is more likely optimal as a training tool for novices, our PGY1, um, which is what we had uh, decided to do here. So this is one of our PGY1 totally fake shoots. Um, this is unplugged, and he has he's seen absolutely nothing, but it looks really cool. Um, and we've essentially uh, incorporated it to our internal orientation before they go to the emergency department. Um, I have more details on that during our meeting conference today about what's happening. And then the tech journal um, got a wind of this and maybe something that you may ask me before. So I wanted to um, end this with the final couple of minutes and thinking about where this is going to go into healthcare. Uh, so you saw one, just one tiny application of how it might work with resuscitation. But there's a couple of new developments that we think that the technology will I'll catch up to some of the newer things uh, that you're working on in simulation and training. So one is called hybrid simulation, which you may already do now, um, but with VR you have yet one more hybridization. Uh, the idea of multiplayer, which is um, pretty important in the gaming industry, will now come to healthcare to work on teamwork um, and voice command, uh, particularly if the user interfaces are not all that great for our not so video gaming physician. So. This is an example of hybrid simulation. So this is a standardized patient. This is not her actual baby, um, right? This is the actual mannequin baby, but you're adding the SP experience uh, and the psychological fidelity with the physical fidelity of being able to deliver a baby. So this is an example of a hybrid simulation, uh, kind of filling in uh, the gap of uh, physical reality here with the most, uh, with psychological fidelity, um, and then the physical fidelity is done to this place. You can use VR on top of other things where if the haptics of VR are particularly weak, you might be able to replace the haptics with something else. Uh, we've already seen this slide with multiplayer, but this is particularly exciting once the computing, the, the computing power and your wireless and the 5G networks are coming. Um, you can actually do team training while in your pajama. Really cool. Um, and then finally, voice recognition. We actually have a pretty robust AI of, of voice recognition that is not part of VR currently on your phone and on your different devices. There are probably some right now that are listening to us. Alexa, are you there? Okay. Um, but voice recognition is actually already built into all VR headsets. They have microphones on the inside. They just aren't telling you about it because it's not ready for prime time. But um, the technology is ready voice recognition and programming for that end. So you can make it much more realistic in a way that you would actually do a code presentation, which is verbal, um, and introduce that to VR. And I wanted to leave with this. Um, VR is particularly um, populated with a lot of startups that came from the gaming world, um, and they have a gamer mentality of lots of small little companies trying to make it big. Many of them are entering healthcare. We also have hospital executives and insurance companies that are thinking about VR. So part of the thing I, I want to leave with you is that 
we also should be in control of our futures with how virtual reality is implemented judiciously within our field. And so I will leave it to you to make it the evidence-based implementation of VR is our responsibility as healthcare providers. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks. It was, a, it was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. I was intrigued by the heart rate data that you showed. Um, first, the, the surprise, the Southern California chill population has basal heart rates in the 80s. I would have thought lower. But what I'm, the, the question is, the, the delta in heart rate with the codes versus the simulated VR codes, could you relate any of that to the, the amount of physical activity? Obviously, that can be tracked with uh, a Fitbit or whatever physical activity measurement in terms of is that why the heart rates were faster because in reality they're moving around during a code versus a VR uh, code where they're, they're not uh, potentially as physically active. Sure. So to paraphrase the question, number one, we, we're not as chill as we think we are. Number two, um, what is the possibility of confounding by motion or movement as a physical exertion? Right? So I think that's a very, very important confounder. We do have, um, there were accelerometers as part of the hexoskin, and as part of our um, data collection, we were not allowed to interrupt medical care during the data collection so that they had to physically come back to the computer or wherever they were charting, and then the salivary cortisol and the heart rates were turned on. So they weren't at least moving during, but of course they may have done some movements around. Um, when we measured our emergency department in terms of maximum movement, it similarly um, potted the way, unless you guys have changed here severely, um, that A side, B side. Basically, you have an A side, B side, and a replicate A, a prime B side um, on the other side. So the total amount of real estate is relatively small, and nobody was actually found to be running, um, which is good. So, yes, there's probably some motion, um, but at the same time, we, there's still motion with regular patient care that was in the the other side of the delta, if you will, the non-critical side. Thanks. Hey, Todd, that was really f fabulous. Thanks, thanks so much for bringing us up up to date. Um, the issue of, of um, haptics, the tactile experience of resuscitation, uh, the huge advantage of mannequin-based simulation is, you know, holding the interosseous needle, the laryngoscope, the uh, you know, touching the mannequin. Uh, what is the future of that? How, how does, would that conceivably work in, in the VR space? I don't have any sense of that at all. Sure. Um, so the question was about uh, how to fill the gap of poor haptics, right? And VR will have a particularly poor haptics for quite some time. The current technologies for mimicking haptics are vibration, which you've had in different video game controllers. There are devices that mimic some level of force, so currently you can actually add, um, there are devices that will feel like you're moving in one direction or another in your hand, and that's actually great for what um, a VR laparoscop laparoscopy or maybe an intubation, for example. But there's nothing that prevents you from going past a solid object, right? So that is a fundamental limitation of VR. You cannot create something that's, uh, that you can put weight on it. And um, we've had a couple of times for, where I was anecdotally watching, um, when you're in this VR, there's a gurney, and some of our tendency is to put our, our weight on it. And we've had two people almost fall, no injury, um, because of that, because there's nothing that you can replicate uh, in VR to, to basically resist you. There are other ways to do fine haptics, but nothing that will resist you. And therefore, hybrid simulation is one of the solutions that's proposed. Um, right now, there are quite a few um, apps and uh, virtual reality that are uh, devices, I guess, that are, are coupled with CPR mannequins so that you can do CPR virtually onto a virtual patient, but in order to get that feel, you need to actually take the mannequin of it. Right? So hybrid simulation is one of the other solutions that people use in VR to get that tactile component. Put something in there, an actual instrument, an actual mannequin, even if it's a store department store mannequin, or for procedures, um, parts of um, body replicated fuel.
Thanks, Todd, for um, a terrific talk. I just wondered, um, one of the questions I have is in terms of using this for experiential learning, whether it's the 3D um, uh, virtual reality or uh, computer-based case simulation. It seems to me like one of the advantages over the mannequin-based simulation is the visual authenticity of what you're seeing. And one of the things that I've wondered about is recreating some of our cases where things didn't go well because people either misinterpreted some data or parts of the physical exam or, um, you know, communication. And just wondered your thoughts on um, how gaming type um, technology could be used so that people experience the, the situation that could lead to an adverse outcome and recognize the cues that should have them avoid it in the future. Sure. Um, so what I think you're referring to is this concept of do-over rounds, if you will, that if there were an adverse event that you could go back um, with traditional root cause analyses and patient safety uh, methods, but really using VR on top of that to replay it from the um, to re-experience, if you will. And there are movements to do that. Um, there's a uh, European uh, EHR company, so it's not Cerner, it's not Epic, that's looking at using de-identifiable data and essentially just porting it into a virtual human so that you can select any patient that had an adverse event, click, and then all their vital signs and all their laboratories become part of a virtual patient that you can then do whatever you need to do and simulate around. So that there are these, um, and it works great because it's all electronic, so it's literally just one single pipeline as opposed to transposing it and turning it into a mannequin-based case, which is quite labor intensive. So there are ways um, in the future to transport patient data into virtual reality to try and re-simulate what had happened 24 hours ago. Uh, so yeah, there are efforts for that. I think legalities here in the United States are a little bit trickier first, um, but those are definitely possibilities. That was terrific, thanks so much. Um, I've actually tried the uh, Oculus uh, Rift and um, uh, it is discombobulating when you use it uh, first and you do have a, a feeling of, um, uh, of nausea and things like that after you finish with it. And I, I know that it's not recommended uh, to be used with uh, individuals under 12 years of age. Do you, um, do you see changes being made in that? Because I could see how uh, for, for children, tweens and, and others, this could be extremely effective in teaching them things like how to uh, give themselves uh, uh, shots if they have diabetes and things like that. What, what do you see the future of actually being able to use this uh, in training for children? Great. So thanks for that question. So this is more about the patient-focused VR, um, particularly for children. So the references to the warnings for youth using VR, so the age limit for Oculus Rift is 12 and over is the recommendation. And then for Gear VR and some Samsung devices um, is uh, 10. And the, the age cutoff is really about stereopic um, development. In other words, there are certain ways that the, um, it's, that the illusion of three-dimensionality is projected that may make the growing eye get used to a type of vision that is not helping. And that part is relatively unknown, and so these are relatively conservative age, conservative age limits. So it is unlikely that a single use of 10 minutes is going to really affect the child's eye. Um, it's really about continued use that they're really worried about. So those studies will, of course, have to our ophthalmologist um, and a few series over there. Um, for children, I think for acute uses, it should be fine. And it is it's like trying to keep your two-year-old off of your iPad. They're going to use it. Um, and for acute uses, I just don't see any issues with employing it here um, in any of these places. So anytime there's a painful procedure, whatever the child life um, implementation would be, can incorporate VR as well. Great presentation, and VR definitely is part of the future of medical education. Um, as someone who uses simulation as an education tool, one of the things we 
we struggle with is some artifacts and you you recognize that there is some artifacts in accepting this as reality. Is there any direct comparison, like when you have a, a learner who doesn't believe in simulation, they only give 50%, when they use VR, are they more likely to be engaged in the scenario because they have no option? Do you have that data? Sure. Um, the question is about um, whether VR can transcend some of the, the immersive limitations of mannequin-based VR, such that mannequin-based sim, such that certain learners who are averse to mannequin-based sim or the, the eye rolling of mannequin-based sim might actually be more involved in VR. Um, the short answer is we don't have that data because VR is relatively new. And constructing a VR versus mannequin-based simulation is study is actually pretty difficult because you, the actual patient outcome has to be one of the other medium. In other words, for example, you could do a randomized control trial, have one group do VR, have another group do SIM, and then, and then what would you base the final test on SIM or VR? One side will have an advantage, naturally, unless you do patient outcomes, but they tend to be rare outcomes. So the, the evidence is not yet there. We do know that for those who are particularly audiovisual, and because you're on your own and you can do it on your free time, um, there, there are lower barriers to getting people into VR, um, particularly if they've already had a gaming experience. So we do have people who get into VR, say, this is stupid, and then they immediately go out. And that will happen for the all of simulation. But um, the, for those who are more captured by audiovisual, or who do really well with movies and sci-fi, they tend to do quite well 